What is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Limited Resources. This is episode number 348. My name is Marshall. I'm one of your limited resources. And joining me on the couch, <laughs> it's Luis Scott Vargas. Luis, how are you, sir? I'll have you know, first of all, that I'm not lying down. No. I'm, I'm sitting up. It's business time. <laughs> but you do have your phone in your hand. Are you... I'm looking at the show notes. tweeting? Oh, the no, show no. notes. All right. I don't have to take it from you this yeah. time? No, you, you do not. Uh, not yet. <laughs> and things are good. Things are good. It's it's the night before Pro Tour. This is, like, like I was actually just telling Marshall, uh, one, of, one of my favorite shows is just always the Pro Tour show. Just because... Yeah. It's the culmination of, you know... Weeks of testing, trying to figure out the format and giving you the freshest, uh, hottest, up-to-date tips on uh, just whatever the, the, the current limited format is. So, and plus, this is a really good limited format. Yeah, we've really been uh, having a lot of fun with this one. So, for those not in the know, we're in Australia. Luis and I are in his hotel room in Sydney. And uh, and like he said, this is, uh, I mean, really just hours before the Pro Tour. Yeah, it is uh, 8.40 p.m. our time. My deck list is due in three hours. In three hours, and you have not submitted it yet. I have not, no. I hope the show doesn't go that long. <laughs> yes, but the good news is you feel good about the limited format, and that's what we're going to be talking oh, yeah. about here today. And I'm excited to talk about it, too. I've been putting in a lot of drafts, talking with you, talking with uh, other players on the coverage team and stuff like that. So we will be getting to all of that today because we're going to be doing our insider on Pro, uh, Pro Tour testing here for Pro Tour Eldritch Moon. Um, before we do, I want to remind you that Channel Fireball, <laughs> that Limited Resources, is brought to you by ChannelFireball.com. They are a fantastic place for you to go and find everything you need magic related. That's right. You can get free content. That's one of the best things about the site. I remember way back when I first started checking out magic content and stuff, 2008, 2009 was right when Channel Fireball was first spinning up. I mean, it it was in its infancy at the time. And I remember I used to go there every day because there was content and it was like, you know, I got to read stuff from John Laux, you know, who was like a local player for us. And uh, and that has, of course, developed into the best content site on the web for uh, for magic. You can find videos, podcasts, articles from some of the best players in the world, all teaching you how to improve, just like we're trying to do on this show here. And of course, while you're there, you can pick up singles, you can pick up sealed product, you can sell your cards back, you can get a 30% bonus if you want to trade them in for more packs so that you can draft again. It's all there on Channel Fireball. Great customer service. They're going to get stuff shipped out to you quickly, and we know you'll be happy with them. Please do check them out. Also, you can uh, you can support the show directly via the Patreon. That's right. Patreon's a cool website that allows you to support the creators that uh, that help make your life better or that that make you happy. And uh, it's a real straightforward site. You go on there, you sign up, you can pick however much you you want per show. You can also pick um, how much you want per month, and it will cap it so that you can stay within your budgets and you get some cool bonuses like some thank you cards in the mail and uh, and some other neat stuff. And uh, you can unlock the hidden goal of us doing a fully cooking-themed bonus episode. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, did, I did see someone suggest that. They, 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 they might have seen your, your, your sweet corn video. <laughs> that, 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 or, or your last sign-off. Yes. <laughs> yeah, Luis and I are both, uh, both very much into cooking. One of the cool perks you get from being a patron as well is you get to submit questions for the Patreon question of the week, which we've got here from Jeremiah Ratliff. He says, hey, Marshall and Luis, I've been faithfully supporting and listening to the show for just over a year now, and I want to know, what is the difference between next leveling someone and fancy play syndrome? These are both terms that we use on the show occasionally. Um, there have been several times where I've heard people in my local game store talking about next leveling someone, but to me, it just sounds like they're trying to be cute and manage to get away with it that one time. Thanks for everything you do. Thanks, Jeremiah. Great question. Um, there's a fine line between actually, you know, next leveling someone in a sense of, you know, making a play that encourages them to play into what you're trying to do or play around something and to trying to do that and failing by, by you know, entering the realm of fancy play center. What do you see as a difference? Uh, whether it works or not. <laughs> <laughs> so there's another thing we use on the show. It's called results-oriented <laughs> thinking. <laughs> so it's, it, it is tough because, you know, we, we are a, a nuts and bolts podcast. We are trying to, to improve your, your limited game as best we can. And as such, when this topic comes up, I generally steer people away from from getting too fancy, from 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 trying too hard to use you know Jedi mind tricks or next level people because just frequently that just does not work out. But when it does work, it, you do you do feel pretty clever. Basically, 
I think that the biggest difference between getting too fancy and actually next leveling someone is what what you're giving up to to do this trick and whether it's distracting you from playing the game well. Mm-hmm. So if you if you really need your opponent to use a combat trick, so your only way to win is them using a combat trick and then you know you you blowing them out. Playing in a way to encourage them to do that, it just gives you your best chance of winning. If you if you if you want to try to trick them into attacking with like you know too few creatures, so you put yourself dead on board by making an attack, that that's that's pushing it. You yeah, know, that, that that that's d- doing the the slightly too fancy play. So there's no hard and fast rule here, but I think that if you're playing if you if you're playing well and you're not like missing stuff, the different next level and generally just improve increases your chance of victory even if your opponent doesn't fall for it whereas fancy play syndrome often is just exploitable yeah that's you know going back to what you said at the beginning there you know we we do try to be pretty straightforward in what we teach on the podcast and there's a reason for that uh which is that most people would benefit most from cleaning up their technical play to this more straightforward approach to magic then the good players and with more experience, you'll start to recognize times when you should break from that norm and try to make a play against somebody, you know, who, who on, that it might work on or might increase your win percentage rather than doing it just to try to be cute or to try to get somebody. I think that, you know, if you if you're trying to make one of these plays that is a little bit out there and when you think about it to yourself, if your motivation is that you want to be able to tell your friends that you got somebody to tell, you know, rub it in that other person's face because maybe they always beat you at the local shop whatever it is, you're probably off on that. If your motivation is, look, I think that this gives me the best percent chance to win this game, then you're probably on the right track and you should go ahead and go for that that trickiness. Um, generally avoid it. I mean, you know, you play very high-level magic against very high-level players. There's a decent amount of deception, but I mean, isn't it still just like technical play is still like the, the foundation? You can you can get everywhere with just perfect technical play or near perfect mm-hmm. technical play, like without worrying about like really tricking your opponent, getting inside their head. I'm not saying that that's not part of the game, especially yeah when you are playing against people you know who really know what's going on and you really understand them. But I can name plenty of players who just never do that and are still just considered among the best players. So yeah. you don't think that that's something you need in your arsenal to to, yeah. to be the best. You know, I don't see Owen. You know, trying to like mind level people or next level people all the time no it's within his range now yeah but it is definitely not how he has like kind of built his reputation right as one of the best players in the world <laughs> okay uh let's get a cracker pack in here this one comes from abe who says lr rocks thank you abe here this format is so sweet i fell asleep drafting it last night just because i wanted to like <laughs> it didn't it was definitely a bad idea draft you know but... that's the first pack of eldritch moon i've seen opened in real life what I've done zero drafts except online. Really? Yep. You guys haven't been drafting like in a I, at a table in a group. I so some of our team has, but I I didn't do a draft until I got to Australia and until wow. I was on a Magic Online. Done a lot of drafts in real life and uh, online. I've done a lot of drafts. <laughs> yeah, I bet you have. I, I just a side story. It, I got a chance to come and visit the testing team um, as they were all huddled in their conference room and everybody was on laptops drafting. And Luis walked away from his because he had three drafts open that were just auto-picking because <laughs> his computer look stopped. Look. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes you do get into the fancy play syndrome. <laughs> you can't help it. Um, all right, our first card is actually a pretty good one. It's Olivia's Dragoon. That's the uh, one in a black 2-2 vampire, and uh, you can discard a card to give it flying. <laughs> all right, so I promise we won't have too many asides, but today when we were laying out oh, no, we're all, all the black asides. commons and uncommons, because mm-hmm. we, we go through and we rank you know, every every card. Mm-hmm. And and Matt Nass was like, I think the dragon should be higher. And we're like, do you mean the dragoons? He's like, no, the dragon. We're like, what are you talking about? And he was talking about the, the four or five flying vampire. Oh. He was calling it a dragon because it was like a big flyer. And we're like, look, you can't call it a dragon when there's a common called dragoon. Yeah, that's really... <laughs> and then when asked to clarify, he said, no, the dragon. <laughs> anyway, uh, Olivia's dragoon is is a good card. It is, yeah. sadly for black, one of the best black commons. Yeah. What it does is it offers an efficient body with a good enabler. You know, it makes your madness cards work. It's actually fine with Delirium too. You can just pitch a land if you need a land in your graveyard. But yeah. look, I'm not excited about first picking a black card. I'm definitely not excited to first pick Olivia's Dragoon. I'm not either. Uh, but if I am in, in the aggressive black deck, this is a, a, a very important card. Uh, Desperate Sentry is next. It's two and a white for a human. 
when it dies, you get a 3-2 Eldrazi. And if you've got Delirium, it gets plus 3, plus 0. Oh. So and it's a 1-2. Two. Two. And it's a 1-2, right. It's funny. You know, there's a lot of these, like, middling 3-drops. And I, I know it sounds weird because these cards are rated relative to each other, but it feels like they've all gone up for me. <laughs> like, actually, this card's okay. And at first, I really didn't like it that much. And I'm like, you know, this card, like, actually does do enough for me to put it in my deck. And I, I didn't think that was going to be the case. Yeah, it's, it's the kind of card I want in my deck if I have emerge cards and yeah. largely do not otherwise. The blue-white the blue, emerge But I want to have emerge cards in my deck, so I, yeah. I, I, I would still take Dragoon over it, but oh, Emergent yeah. Sentry is a card. It, it's actually a card I, I, I didn't think it would be. Um, Ingenious Scob, I like this one a lot. It's two and a blue for a 2-3 with Prowess. It's a zombie horror, and uh, you can pay blue to uh, give it plus one, minus one until end of turn. This card just rocks all. Oh, it's 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 incredibly good. Even if you don't have a ton of spells in your deck, it's still yeah. a good card. Water course was always a playable stuff. So. Yeah, and this ingenious is, better, is, yeah. is as we like to say, the smart pick. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Woodland Patrol, the three two vigilance for two and a green. Uh, not super impressed by Woodland Patrol, to be honest. I have yet to play one of these, and I'm yeah. ha- hoping that streak continues. Yeah, it, it, it is not on my list of cards that it's got just, better. The, the problem is it's a 3-mana three 3-2 three with basically an irrelevant ability right. that just trades for a loss of value against almost every other card your yeah. opponent can imagine. Yeah, playing. It, it happens to be a human scout, but it turns out that doesn't push it over the edge. Um, Weirded Vampire, that's the 3-and-a-black uh, 3-3, black, three, three, and it manages for 2-and-a-black. So, so not a huge madness payoff, but... Definitely a playable card, and if you're discarding it to something that's giving you a benefit, then you do kind of end up up a card or half a card, but in general, you're not really getting away with much. If you go like Dragoon into Weirded Vampire, it's like, nah, eh, you kind of did it, but... You, yeah, you, it's a good start. You, it's like you cast an Ingenious Scub. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, prophetic Ravings is the red aura that uh, lets your creature get haste and... Um, Rummage, uh, I think it's terrible. Well, I guarantee you I like it more than you do because I think that it has a place, but it's not a card I'm yeah. taking early. And well, where is the place? Because I haven't even found the place It's yet. really just red-black with like five or six madness cards. Okay. Because look, the ability to rummage away like two lands in the mid-game is worth something. That the is. The format is slow. That is real. And if you madness one or two cards, you kind of got there. That being said, you get this card of two cards left in the pack yeah. frequently, so you never have to spend a pick on it. It's more, do you want to add it to your deck? Yeah. Also, it does have the random upside of holding it in your hand, playing a creature, playing it, it gets haste, whatever. I'm reaching here. <laughs> uh, Lunark Mantle. Here's one we got to talk oh, yeah. about. So this is a one in a white aura. Gets, a creature gets plus two, plus two, and has pay a mana, sacrifice a permanent, and the creature gets flying until end of turn. Lunark Mantle is, is surprisingly a playable card. Yes. It, it just leads to a good amount of pressure early, and then you can start throwing away lands to get the last points of damage through. It combos with cards like Lone Rider. It, it is it is definitely a better than it looks card. It's not it's not you know it's not a first pick, but it is a. Do you it think is, it's a second pick? I would like I would like to not take this away from the first five picks, but it's also a card that you can put this in your aggressive white decks, and you you should not feel bad about that. Yeah. So my thought on it is I don't like it. I still don't like it. I don't think it's a good card. I think you should pick it up late oh, in the pack. Oh, no. I, I've played against right? 10 times as many Lunar Mantles than, <laughs> than I put in my deck. Yeah. But I, I have to but respect it. But you do it. respect it. Yeah. Yes. And I feel the same way. Um, then again, I take Drag under really highly. <laughs> so when people play Lunar Mantle, I'm like, yeah, sure. <laughs> you know, so I might be skewed a little bit. It is it. a backdoor delirium enabler, it too. It is. It really is. Yeah. Um, Fogwalkers next. One in a blue for a 1 3 Skulk Spirit. And uh, when it enters the battlefield, a target creature an opponent controls doesn't untap. It does not tap the creature. No. It just makes an untap. No. Uh, Very this, medium. This this is one of the things we did when we sorted all the cards is there was a dividing line between the cards that you could sometimes play and the cards you basically should never play. Mm. This is on the wrong side of that line. Yeah, I it's agree. Just, just a bad card. This is bad. All right, now we're getting some business here. This is a card I've been taking a lot higher than I thought it was. It's Thermo Alchemist. So this is the yeah. one in a red 0-3 with Defender, you can tap it to do one damage to your opponent, and whenever you cast an instant or sorcerer, you untap it. See, this is the perfect kind of two drop because so good. it defends you against, you know, two power creatures if your opponent's foolish enough to put them in their deck. And then it just does one to two damage a turn, unblockable in the late game. It it's kind of secretly a red blue card, but you can put it in a red black deck too. Yeah. I, I've only played it in red blue, but I've taken it as highly as second pick. Just looking to try to make that deck work, you know, kind of pushing that direction. I had a, a funny moment in a, in a side draft at the GP on Friday. I, I was here early and I got to do some drafts. And uh, I played it on turn two and my opponent was like, oh, thank God. And th- the reason that they were relieved is because I didn't play a, a tattered uh, 
Hunter. Hunter. Yeah, or Hunter. The, the two one flying. Yeah, and I was just like looking at my hand. I'm like, this is going to do way more damage yeah. than that, dude. And it did. He's like, that thing did 12. And I'm like, yeah, I just like yeah. had a grip. So I really like that card. Um, I'm going to put it over in the Ingenious Scob pile for now. No, wow. I, I, I'm, I'm always taking Scob over that. You like Scob over it? Yeah, it's just too too beefy. Yeah, so the, the th- interesting thing is that um, if I'm playing blue-red spells, I'd rather have the Alchemist, but the thing is the Scob is always good no matter what, as long as you're casting it, and the Alchemist, that is definitely not the case. Uh, I would also rather have the Scob in blue-red spells. I, you would? The, the only time I wouldn't is if my curve was getting too cluttered, but early, I would rather. I, I think the scop's better. It's a three four slash four power creature. Like yeah. it just it just gets in there too much. It is much. great. Yeah, I, I guess I just uh, value the two drops. Naval Gast Herald is our first uncommon. It's two and a blue for a two one flash flying spirit. And when it, it or another spirit enters the battlefield, uh, you can tap target creature an opponent controls. Card's fine. Quite a good card. Yeah. Like and see, so this is a funny thing about this format is a lot of cards are are actually just color pair cards, not as much just monocolor cards like would you consider this a a white blue card yeah white blue is is where i think it's at its best it's not strictly it's not strictly there you you can put it in your blue green deck it'll be a fine card you always play it but like when i see a nebel gas herald i'm like oh white blue is really where i want this card Mm -hmm. yeah card's fine i i I like ingenious god better than it yeah it's funny at the beginning of the format i thought i would like the the herald more but ingenious god is better i believe i think it's better too wow here's uh, this is another card that i love (laughs) scour the laboratory yeah, yeah this one's not some bad. Uh, four blue, blue, you instant. You draw three cards, and if you have delirium, it costs two colorless less to cast. Yeah, this is a. I, I found it to be good. Like it is a powerful card. You get to that mid to late game, and you're you can crush your opponent with card advantage. But it's a little clunky. It's it's a little more on the pet card end of things for me, I think, than the like just raw power level. But it's good. No, I, as much as I like drawing three cards, which, which I do like, Ingenious Scob is better for the decks yeah, where the scour is. is good. It's definitely better. Uh oh. What do we got? Oh, we did it. It's your boy. <laughs> <laughs> it's a foul emissary. This is a card that Luis and I have both become smitten with. Uh, it's two and a green. We were talking about it at dinner, in fact. It's two and a green for a 1-1 one, one human horror. And uh, when it enters a battlefield, you get to look at the top four cards of your library. You can take a creature and put it in your hand. And then when you sacrifice it while playing a creature with a merge, or a spell with a merge, I should say, you uh, get a 3-2 Eldrazi. Card's fantastic. It's very, very it good. It does it all. It really does. It digs for your for your big emerge creatures. It also offers a three mana discount plus the emerge discount uh, on them. And then you even get a three two back for your trouble. So you don't actually end up giving up a card or even really tempo. So it's card advantage and man advantage. And it just, it does everything you want. This card is somehow very underrated. It's very, it goes around late. The funny part is, is that people are starting to catch on. I had uh, a situation where I played a foul emissary. I looked at the top four. I hit a creature. It wasn't an emerge card. And my opponent killed it. Yeah, I've had I've had it. I was g- like, g- wait, you're not supposed to know that. Yeah, it got bombardment. I'm like, wait, no. <laughs> I wanted that to actually live, and I, I I wonder how often it's just correct just to snap it off because you know they know if I get to untap, play my fourth land. There's any number of emerge creatures that I can use to just completely blow them out. Yeah, make a three two. Play a retro group or a lashweed lurker, and it's just the game is you know you're really violent. hard for your opponent. Yeah, so I I like their play of just killing the thing. But anyway. Um, it's going right in the pile. Let's put it that way. Well, I'm definitely taking it over either of these comments. Over Scott. I, th- I, th- I think it's better than any common. Okay. Any common? Yes. Okay. Any of them? The all removal of them. spells? All okay. okay. Um, Kessig Prowler is our double face card. This is uh, green for a 2 1. It's a werewolf horror, and you can pay four and a green to make it a 4 4 that has to be single blocked. Well, can only be single blocked, I should say. Quite good. The the werewolves in this set are universally good. So high on them. They're, Every the, card. We, Every we've one. been calling them monstrous. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> you, your mileage may vary on that one. Yeah. But, uh, I call them morphs, but whatever. That also works. <laughs> but basically, they're all they're all just you know cards that you can play early to have good effect, so they they impact the board early, and then you can pay a bunch of mana to have them impact the board late. And that's just like the perfect kind of split card. I mean, it's so powerful that flexibility, and it's so easy to underrate. Yeah. It's not as good as Foul Emissary, but I, agree. I think it's good. I, I Especially this one, I, I definitely like Foul Emissary better. But that being said, I have been running a lot of, of these. I just run every one I can get my hands on. Literally every single one in the set is good. Yep. Like none of them are bad. So that's that's it. the red ones, the green ones, all of them. Are rare. Will it knock off the Foul Emissary? Nope. Uh, it's Impetuous Devils. 
So it's two red red for a six one trample haste. It's a devil. When it attacks up to one target creature, defending player controls blocks it. This combat of fable, you of course get to choose that. And then at the beginning of the end step, you have to sacrifice it. It is close. It's a fine card. This is frequently going to kill one of their creatures and do a couple points of damage to them. Yeah. It get, you know, if they have a way to instant speed deal one, of course, that it's not straight up a removal spell. It doesn't do well against first strike, but... It does very poorly against first strike, yeah. But I think it is close. I, I would still just lead with Foul Emissary here. I would too. But Impetuous Devil is not a bad card. It's not bad, but I, I it's for, like I would take Ingenious Scob over Impetuous Devils. I'd take Thermal Alchemist over it too. I don't like uh, it that I, much. I would take the, the Devils over the Alchemist and, and over Scob? the Scob. You would. I would take it under the Foul Wow, emissary. maybe I'm underrating it. I don't have it that high. Double red. Ugh. Um, also, you know how I am. Like, when you're behind, like, what is, like, it's maybe still, still just kills their 4-4. Four, four. Yeah, not if it's attacking you. That is true. It does not do well against tap creatures. Yeah. Anyway, I, I am taking Foul I'm yeah, with you, man. Same. I love it. Okay, so let's get into this, Luis. We've got, um, some, some sweet stuff to cover. So, to set the stage here, you have been testing with Team Channel Fireball slash Ultra Pro here for, at home and here for quite a while now. Uh, I have uh, the the early part was more us doing like limited meetings and me talking to the folks who've been drafting a lot. They do so draft weekends in like Madison. Uh, it's all the guys from there went to you know two and a half days or whatever of just nonstop drafts. And then uh, you know Paul Chian and Corey Burkhart, some of the guys from California, like you know they they met and did like uh, like a draft weekend in NorCal. I don't know if Corey actually made it up, but anyway, the, mm-hmm. there was a couple different draft camps. I didn't go to any of them. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I had a, a child to attend to, as it yes, turns out. Yes. But uh, when we got here, here being Sydney, drafts are out on Magic Online. And, you know, misadventures with three drafts firing at the same time, <laughs> notwithstanding. Uh, I'm trying to think of how many drafts I've done in the past three days, but it's probably around 30-something. <laughs> okay, uh, so you've been working. Oh, yeah. Because I think that the best way to truly understand a format is... Not just, you know, get the hang of what's going on, like, in terms of, like, what archetypes are good and what cards are good, but also just play to the point where you just know all the cards and you know, and you just get a sense of, like, this card's been overperforming, this card's been underperforming, and it's hard to do that unless you just get a lot of reps in, so. And what what does the testing look like for you guys? Like, so you're sitting there uh, drafting on your computer. Are there people watching? Are you discussing things? Is it, you know, how does that, like, how does the information travel? Yeah, you actually got a glimpse of it earlier, so we had a, we had a conference room that we rented, and we actually had a... One of the drafts on the big screen, because we, we had an HDMI cable for that. And then, you know, people yelling out picks and stuff. And then a bunch of other people on laptops. And basically, as drafts fire, you'll go and watch, like, you know, the first pack, first pack and a half. Once someone's like, I'm settled into red-blue, the rest, that's not that hard. Because the the, the, the difficult part of draft is not, what, what once I'm red-blue, what's the best red or blue card out of every pack? Yeah, because there's only three options total. Right. Yeah. The difficult part is like the first six picks, or even even in pack two sometimes like you, you, you switch colors. So you get to like cherry pick that part, and then you do have to play the games because you need to actually see what the results are, but like not the results in, in terms of win-losses, more the results of like, how good is Ingenious Scob? Well, it was great these last five games, so I'm going to say the card's great. Yeah. Yes, that card is great. Uh-huh. So... Getting getting a lot of that and just kind of synthesizing that is really important, and uh, that that's kind of how I end up. You know, sometimes things change. Like my impression in two weeks could be a little bit different than it is now. We're gonna that, that's more like refinement, though. I would be surprised if I if in two weeks think all of a sudden actually white green beatdown is good because I just don't think that's gonna be the case. Mm-hmm. Like I, I don't think that's good now, and I don't think I will will, will like it. I might come around on like. Actually, I think I would take Ingenious Scob over Thermal Alchemist or vice versa in two weeks because that's the sort of like fine tuning. The, all we're trying to get here is basically the broad strokes on which archetypes are good and then trying to nail down like kind of like a, a pick order for the early picks. Right. Now, you know, when I, I do just want to because we have you on the show, right? And you're testing with like one of the top teams. And I think it's cool for the listeners to get a chance to kind of look behind the scenes here. I'm curious about how discussions go, right? You, you mentioned that um, people are yelling out picks. I'm sure that there's disagreements among picks. Uh, you know, how is the information presented to each other and how do you guys come to conclusions? So it's interesting. A lot of it is, is you know, solitary. As in like, it's useful for all 13 people to do a bunch of drafts just on their own because you, you want to be able to try to have like your own conclusions you know, and your own kind of like opinions but also, like the, the the group ones are very important. Like, like 
you should take this because of this. Or no, 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 I don't like that. You should do this because of this. As long as people are providing reasons. You're not just like saying things. And then you kind of try to get it all together in the in the limited meeting, which we actually had right before recording here. Yeah, good which timing. Is, which is convenient. Um, so what we did is we first started talking about like, much like the structure of the show, we're going to talk about the format as a whole. Like what are just like the overarching themes? Because it's important to know like this is this is a slow format. This is a fast format. These are the things that are good. These are the things that are bad. And then from there, we looked at like, what do all the color pairs look like? And then let's rank all the commons and uncommons. And then let's take... So you're getting really nitty gritty at this point. Yes. It's actually like part of what we want to do is like, you know, it literally like we had every common and uncommon for each color, like, you know, ranked within each color. And then you take those and overlay them with other colors. And then the, the last part is let's take the, you know, the top rares or top uncommons and commons and put them on a spectrum and then put all the rares on that spectrum. Because... So for, right, because that shows you like key breaking points, right? Yeah, like one of them is clear shot. So clear shot, you know, is in our opinion the the best uncommon card. Is fantastic, right? So the best non rare is clear shot. So all the rares that are better than clear shot just go in a pile because it doesn't really matter relative to each other. Because you're not going to get those two in the same. Yeah, pack I mean technically you can, ever. you can get yeah. a flip card. Yeah. So you, if you open, you know, Gisela and Nahiri's Wrath, like you have to decide. But them. even then, you're still saying who cares? Right. Like flip a coin, it's eighty percent. Right. It's yeah. not really worth arguing. Yeah arguing that so all the cards that are better than clear shot go in that pile and then but then from there on out it's a spectrum where you have all the like best uncommons and eventually the best commons and then the rare is kind of on that on that timeline so doing all that gives you you know again the best base to start with you, you'll you'll continue to hone it over the next couple of weeks is there a lot of discussion uh in terms like i know one thing that i like to do um when i'm learning about something and including a new set or anything in life is I'll ask somebody for their opinion, even if I think they know, I know what they're going to say, or even if I know the answer to it, because I want to hear their thought process, right? I just, I want to be able to absorb the factors that they're weighing in. You know, for example, let's say there's a card that's very good, right? It's just, it's just a clearly a good card. I'll say, why do you think it's good? Or, you know, hey, Ben Stark, hey, Luis, why do you think, you know, is this card good? And, you know, sometimes you'll get this snarky, like, well, obviously it's good. Did you read it? Yeah, I did. But why is it good? You know, and seeing how people piece together what they value in a format or in limited or in the specific draft format can, to me, is really valuable. Uh, it's more valuable than just knowing the answer of, yeah, you like the card or no, you don't. Do you get that type of thing, like, in these groups? Definitely. So part of it is you need to be able to explain your position because if you say something like, oh, I... I, I would take Ulvenwald captive over, you know, Galvanic Bombardment. People are going to say, why? They're not going to be like, okay, cool. Because <laughs> that's yeah. just not useful. Right. It, but, but does that, is that, I wonder, you know, you're kind of the de facto leader of the team, right? Uh, in many ways. And doesn't that improperly weigh the opinions on people that are better arguers rather than, like, what if that person's just right? They just suck at telling you why. <laughs> Like, do you have to, like, coax that out of them, or does their opinion just it, lose value? It can be tough. It, I mean, there is some, you know, additional value given to people who can argue their position. Well, but it's not an adversarial process. Like, we're, we yeah, are just Or even just to, present information. Right. We are just yeah. trying to find the truth here. Yeah, yeah. It is also different, like, who's saying the thing, because, yeah. you know, someone like Ben, for example, does have a, a higher authority because he practices limited so much and, and has a good judgment for limited. So if someone else were to say like actually no Ben I disagree with you the burden's kind of on them to like ex explain why but at the end of it we're, we're trying to figure out you know we're trying to figure out why do people think the things they think and who kind of who's right and there's no like you know at the end of the day we're not going to actually find the answers this isn't like there's a yes no correct you know test answer but ideally if people have multiple people have the same opinion some of them will be able to express why yeah and a lot of it is like, or they'll see where somebody's going and kind of, yeah, help it help along. Like the I, I, remember, I remember earlier, like we were talking about uh, the Hanweir Garrison, the two three that when it attacks puts two one one attackers into play. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I was like, hey Pat, you know Pat Cox. He's like, I was like, oh, I saw you play with this play or play against this card in a draft, and you know it actually didn't look that insane. Like they mm -hmm. they actually got a hit with it, but then you just played like a three three, and then they couldn't attack with it again, or you played some two twos, and he's like, yeah. The card didn't do as well against me as I thought it was going to. Okay. And, and that's a data point for you. Right. And that was after some people on our team were like, no, we think this card's really good. We should put it here. And I'm like, you know, I think I would take Lash Weedlurk over that card. I think we should move it down in the pick order. I see. Yeah. Okay. Well, why don't we get into what you guys discovered? 
And uh, we've kind of melded this with what you and I have talked about <laughs> and what I've actually been doing on my own as well. And we've come up with a couple of, uh, you know, big hitters and then kind of a format overview. So why don't we get into this? So first things first, what what are your team's takeaways as far as big picture stuff on the format? The biggest one is is the format is slower, which is funny because it's not like Shadows was a blazing fast format. It was, I would call it an average format. Right. And so... What, when we say the, the, the format is slower, we mean specifically ground tutus, just not very effective. Nope. Like, and, and you know, we had an eye on this when we did the set review with Owen. Right. We were like, there's a lot of two threes around. Yeah. You know? There's a lot of two threes. There's O threes. Mm -hmm. There's creatures that when they die do bad things to you. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> That means that there's less beatdown. There's a there's a lot of mana sinks too. All the like you know red green uh, werewolves give you just this excess stuff to pump your mana into. The emerge creatures do too. You know you can just cast your emerge for eight creature for eight mana. That happens. <laughs> there's bigger creatures, so these mean that first of all cards and shadows got worse or better depending on where, where they fell on this. And second of all, you should be looking for different things. When when you look at a card like Hamlet Captain which looks very good. You know, one in a green, two, two, and it attacks or blocks. You're, you're attacking or blocking humans, get plus, plus one, your other ones. This is a card that I'd be very excited about in Shadows over Innistrad, you know, X3 draft. I'm not really into this card. Captain it, Hammy's it, kind of off in the forest <laughs> yeah. by himself. I know. I, I'm not into this card in, in Eldritch Moon. I just don't think it has a very good home. No, so I agree. So that, that's a really important for, for evaluating, understanding kind of what's going on. Uh, a lot of the... It's interesting because this is a two set block. You know, there's, there's, there are some of the same themes as Shadows. There's some new themes. The themes that are not supported in Eldritch Moon are, are a lot worse. I mean, unsurprisingly, Green White Humans is one of them, like we just yep. mentioned. Uh, green White or Green Black Delirium. Yes, there are cards with Delirium, but it's just not a major theme anymore. No. So, so as much as I love the Delirium decks, it's just not something that comes up nearly as often. Blue green clues, like these are just yeah. There's just not that many. You have one pack of clue enablers, right? right? These clue the, makers, the, yeah. You know the the Erdwall Illuminator went, no, went, went from one, one of my favorites to, to 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 you know the poor little guy just makes no clues. Like, no. So some decks will play them. Sure, it's not like the card. These cards just went from great to terrible, but they went from great to medium. Yeah. Um, what about the grind? You know, what, what about how the games actually play out? I mean, the the grind is real. Cards that even were slow, too slow for shadows are coming into their own, like magnifying glass. Look, I'm not saying the card is a bomb, but no. th this is a real card. You could put it in your deck and draft. I really never put it in my deck before. Me neither. Uh, confirmed suspicions went, oh, yeah. from, went from being like kind of, kind of medium, a little dicey to just great. I've already drafted it twice. Oh yeah. It, it is. It is. In fact, <laughs> in fact, I did have an air wall illuminator last time. Well, I there we go. It, so shame on me, but we yeah, did. It. I mean, confirmed suspicions are just a good card. It's now. just good. Yeah. So this is the sort of thing, thing you, you, you want to worry about. And, that's really all of this is going to kind of color where we're, what we're looking at for for the different color pairs. You you also really want to know which color pairs you should like or you know you should avoid and which ones yeah. are good. We're going to talk about the the ones we like the best. Yeah, we want to give you the highlights. And and every color pair is draftable. Again, we're we're, we're not in, a, in the world where it's like, oh, you're playing black white, you can't win because that's just not true. But Something like blue green or blue red is just much stronger than black white on average. There are just more incentives to be some color pairs than other colors. Yeah, and we know how how it is. This is still early in the format. I mean, the pro tour is tomorrow. So if, if you're our average listener, you might be going to a draft this weekend or firing up a draft on Magic Online, and you want what's the best deck right now? And that's what we're going to talk about today. Oh yeah. So why don't we get into those? Um, let's start off with, well, my favorite and your favorite deck. Uh, not just, and I'm not. Luis and I will sometimes talk about cards that we like in terms of being sweet or cards that we prefer, but I think this deck is just legit the best deck as well, and it's also the sweetest. Uh, it's Blue Green Emerge. This is just one of the new themes of the set. So this is you're going to get your two packs of Eldritch Moon, though there are some actual enablers kind of seated in the shadows too. And the goal of this deck is to play the Emerge creatures. I mean, this is the Blue Green Emerge deck. Yeah. And what it gets out of that is it gets to have these gigantic card advantage producing creatures in play much earlier than they would normally be. And if you have the right enablers, it doesn't even, you know, you're not even paying a price to do that. And that that is really sort of the, like what you'll notice from this deck is that it tends to take over in the mid to late game. Like you can slam those cards pretty early. Turn four is, you know, it happens all the time. 
Um, but also you will tend to dominate in the later part of the game thanks to the card advantage that you get either direct or indirect card advantage from these emerge creatures. So why don't we uh, get into some of the key cards and how they how the deck is actually composed. So the, the, the top of the heap are the emerge creatures since the, those are the cards that are first of all the least replaceable. There's yeah. a lot of cards on the low end that you can sacrifice to them. These are the, you know, the, the sacrifice fodder, but the emerge creatures are, are what you need to prioritize. So then you have these sacrifice fighters. So these are these are your you know enlightened maniacs and, and exultant cultists that you want to sacrifice to emerge. And then there's you know the other spells that make up a normal limited deck. You know some interaction, uh, some cards like grapple to the past or grapple with the past that end up giving you kind of like the normal flow that you you need for limited that that actually do things. But yeah, you know the you know we we opened up an ingenious scob. You know you can yeah, I mean that, that, that's just a deck. card you'll put in your deck. Yeah. But <clears throat> the emerge creatures are really what you're looking at. So, like, Lashweed Lurker is the best one. That's the best of, one of the common and uncommon ones. Card is great. So, the, yeah, this is the 5 4 for emerge of 5 blue green that uh, puts a permanent, non land permanent on top of its owner's library. Yep. And it's a it's a multicolored card. So, you don't have to, like, you know, always snap it off early, but it's also easily easy, easy to splash. You know, I've splashed it in, in blue black. Uh, in, it's pretty easy to, to do that sort of thing, or black yeah. green. And, uh, then you have like Drownyard Behemoth, the uh, the five seven that has hexproof when you when, when you play it, and has flash so that always eats a creature, and then then our then our friend Foul Emissary, yeah, he's actually above the other emerge creatures because Foul Emissary just does exactly what this deck it's wants. It's the best possible enabler. Yeah, yeah. Then, um, Wretched Griff is next. Yeah, the three four flyer for emerge of five and a blue, and then it draws a card. And remember, all these emerge effects are on cast, so even if they're, they're, your creature gets countered, you, you tend to get that effect. Uh, I find Retrograph fantastic. By oh the yeah, Retrograph is great. It's also cheap, six mana. It's only six, so like, you, you can you, you can do it off a two drop on turn four pretty easily. Yep, yeah, and and you can you can also cast it for seven mana, which does come up a decent amount of the time. Yes, just hard cast it. Yep. Then you have like Vexing Scuttler, which gets back a spell from your graveyard. So that one in blue green sometimes you're a little bit short. It's great in blue red, but e- even then, I mean, it's just it's hard to find a deck where you don't have any targets and. These emerge cards just the reason they're so good is that the enablers are so good in this set that you're you're not really paying a cost to assemble this combo. So one of the the dangers of like synergy decks is like, well, if you draw, you know, you have A's and B's, right? These are the two interlocking pieces, and if you draw two A's or you draw two B's, you end up with a deck that doesn't do much. Yeah. And as it turns out, if your A's are the emerge creatures and your B's are the sacrifice fodder, well. Any creature works with an A. Like you can, you if you sacrifice, you have to sacrifice an ingenious scob to to play a retrogriff. That's not the end of the world. It's not. It's, it's really it's, not. It's not optimal, but it's not the end of the world. You still get your three four flyer out, and you still draw a card to replace the creature you sacrificed. And if you draw Exultant Cultist and Enlightened Maniac, well, that's a good turn three and four play. You didn't actually give anything up there. You end no. up with a two two, a three two, and an O two. Yeah. And the two two drives you draw a card. These are just good limited cards. Yeah, these are all just totally. You're fun. not paying a cost to assemble this combo. Right. And when you combo them together, when you go, you know, exultant cultist and a lashweed lurker, it's just like, wow, I'm doing broken things. Yeah, exactly. So you know, a good yeah. example, a counter example to that would be, you know, the thermal alchemist that we talked about right. earlier, right? Like let's say you put this in a card that had literally no instants or sorceries. This is not the kind of card you would be paying a serious cost to yeah. trying to make this thing go. And here you just don't pay that cost. No, you're playing cards that are good on their own that are great when combined. That's why this deck is so good. Yeah. And, you know, you're looking at all, all the cards that go into the deck is just, just part of the reason I'm so high on the deck. Yeah. You do have cards like Primal Druid. This is the, the one and a green for an O three, 3 and then when it dies, you get a land out, yeah. of, your, out of your deck. That, that's not a card you can put yeah. in your deck unless you have a merge. It's eh. Yeah, it's very eh. But, I mean, it's, There's some matchups where I think it's okay if you're splashing, too. Definitely. It's just when they go, like, you know, island of uh, planes, you're like, uh-oh. <laughs> right. If, if your opponent is not naturally attacking on the ground, yeah. this, is, this is more of a niche card. And you, you don't want four Primal Druids in your deck for that reason. But if you, if you get a good mix of the emerge creatures and the, and the things that they want to eat... You're going to end up with a very strong limited deck. Now, we haven't mentioned the rare emerge cards because, you know, who's that lucky? But what about It of the Horrid Swarm? That's one of the, you know, common uncommon ones that we haven't talked about. Yeah, It of the Horrid Swarm. So this is the 4-4 that uh, makes two one ones on play and then is a six and a green if you emerge it. It's, I consider it the backup emerge creature. How come? It's just not as powerful as the other ones because the 4-4 just doesn't punch through the ground as much. Like when you when you emerge this out on turn four or five, 
you didn't really get ahead of the curve. Your like if they can, have two two threes, you're like, well, right. And your opponent can play a five mana four four, and it's not like they're super behind there. Whereas, you know, the five seven or the three four flyer are just a lot more impressive. That being said, I haven't cut Ida the Horde Swarm in my Blue Green Merge decks. Yeah, I, I'm a little higher on Ida the Horde Swarm. The reason I like it is I agree that it, it doesn't have quite as much punch. Like I think Wretched Griff is way better, for example. But I have also not cut it, and I kind of like it. I'm a little higher on it than you are. And the reasoning is that it does do a very good job when you're behind. Like when you are, you know, behind and you're like, crap, you know, like they they choking tethered my blocker and whatever, and you play it of the Horde Swarm, like your board is stable. Like they are not going to kill you that next turn under most circumstances. And for me, this deck has inevitability on its side. You will find your emerge creatures, you will start drawing extra cards, and you will take over because your creatures are better than theirs in the late game. And especially, like you said, once you start hard casting emerge creatures, it's just stupid at some point. And so I like cards that help facilitate me getting into that late game. And then, you know, there are times when sometimes just putting six power on the battlefield, you know, early is like, oh, wow, that is actually very good. It does make up for the, the games where you emerge something and then they kill it and then you're really behind because that is one of the risks of, you know, yeah. you, you, you threw two creatures into one. Yeah, or you vexing Scuttler back nothing or whatever. You right. Know, it's like, okay. It of the Horde Swarm does at least give you a yeah. little bit more board presence. So I still think it's, it's a step behind the other emerge creatures, but it is is certainly a playable one. There's some other uh, cool cards for this archetype too, Luis, that are um, that that range from underrated to kind of off of people's radar. You know, one of them that jumps to mind that's gone up a lot for me over the last week is Bloodbriar. Bloodbriar is pretty good. So it does. it's actually better than I thought. I thought it was very forgettable, but it's no, pretty good. Bloodbriar is a three mana two three, and whenever you sacrifice a permanent, it gives a plus plus one counter. Bloodbriar has a lot of lot of friends. Uh, Terrarian is one. Yes. Uh, clues, if you can pick them up from Shadows cards, are another. Of course, sacrificing things to emerge is good. Uh, <laughs> if your opponent has an edict effect that makes you sacrifice, it actually works too. Which yeah, which the white up. one is, yep. by the way, uh, Blessed Alliance. And uh, if you get one trigger off Bloodbriar, it's a three mana three four, and that's great. And, it's and then not, that's good. Yeah, it's not that hard to get multiple. So no. Also, there's some weird. You really do have to look out for those niche things, right? Like the the Blessed Alliance is one. And I've definitely had positions where I was on Magic Online and I had a Bloodbriar out. And then it's like, I got a Bloodbriar trigger. I'm like, oh, right. That is a sacrifice. <laughs> like, it just slipped my mind that this one random thing that I did, you know, happened to be a, a sacrifice. And uh, you, you will see Bloodbriar be a 3-4 pretty commonly. And then sometimes you can kind of go off with it. And then uh, you also have Grapple with the Past. So this this is a card that I think is very underrated right now. Yeah, so it's really good. One in a green instant. Uh, mill yourself for three and then bring back a land or a creature. But this is a land or a creature from your graveyard. So yeah. It's not of necessarily of just those three cards. And the reason that grapple is so good is, well, there's a, there's a bunch of reasons. One is that this is a format where you don't need to play a creature on turn two to compete. When you miss your two drop and you have a grapple instead, that is perfectly fine. The other is that it's a split card. So it's a land or a spell or a creature in this case. And... That's really valuable. You can keep a two land grapple hand and hit your third land drop, or late game or in the mid game, you can use it to find another spell. So it adds consistency to your deck. There's graveyard interactions, like it fuels delirium. It, it it's just it does a lot of different things and it does it at a very cheap rate. So Grapple with the Past is just a card you should be putting in all your green decks, and it's especially good in the Emerge decks because it helps yeah. you find whichever half of the puzzle that you, you need. I had a deck that had Grapple with the Past. It also had a uh, vessel of nascency. And I remember getting him into a position in the pretty late game where I had 15 cards in my graveyard. Like, I mean, this game had gone on for a while. And I looked at it like, wow, if I draw a vessel, I'm like peeling the top four and hoping to find some big bomb. And if I draw a grapple, I just win. Like, yeah. I get my bomb back and it's over. Because I can look at my graveyard and see I already have exactly what I want to get back. The skill's very nice in the late game. And it's good for a lot of the reasons I, I really like Vessel. Yeah, it isn't quite as good of a, a, a delirium enabler as as Vessel of Nascency, but I like grapple a lot better on average. I think it's a it's a more powerful card. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Emrakul's Influence. This is the two green green enchantment that when you play a seven so cost, funny. Spell draws, you draw a card, draw two cards. Yeah, it's so funny because you just don't need, they all draw cards when you right. cast and you, them. And when you're playing your seven drops, you don't really need the cards. Yeah. Yeah, we, we talked for a while about this one today and then no one was really sold on it. No, it's just funny. It's just the most win more, like absurd card ever. I mean, winning, the only thing better than winning is winning more. So yeah, well, that's like, not how that works. Yeah. Um, Grizzled Angler is kind of an interesting inclusion. You know, it, it's a 2-3 that taps 
uh, to mill two cards. And if there's a colorless creature in your graveyard, you transform it into this like pretty formidable angler yeah, that has four or five. Thing. Yeah, and you can do that pretty early in the game. And you know, if you happen to pick up one of these and you need a three drop, you can put it into this deck, and you, you can't actually put you know emerge creatures in your yard and, and get that angler flipped. And it can take over a game pretty quickly. It also fuels this like self mill sub theme that's present in both blue green and blue red. With cards like Spontaneous Mutation, the minus hmm. X minus O enchantment, Grizzled Angler, uh, Grapple, Delirium. There's just a lot of stuff going on there. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right. Um, what about the Shadows over Innistrad cards that we should be looking out for? So uh, Junau Corpse Trawler is one. This is the it, essentially an Enlightened Maniac. It's, it's you know, four mana for a one on the mix of two, two, and then you sack the one, one to, to your emerge card. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dranyard Explorer's got a little bit more value. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, sack your two, four, and get a, keep a clue. Uh, same with Byway Courier. No, the card is already great, but it is very good in this deck. And then yeah. uh, Stoke Builder is one I've played a little bit more now because it does sack to emerge, and with cards like Grapple, you end up milling yourself. Or Laboratory Blue, Brute. This is the three and a blue for a three, three that mills you for four. Did you like that card? I think it's perfectly playable. Like, okay. It's not a card I'm excited about, but if you have two or three cards that work with self-mill, then it's a fine card. You're not really paying much for the ability. So th- these are all the creatures that kind of... Uh, you know, combine with uh, with the new cards to, to get a little bit more value than maybe they used to. Uh, Delirium also sometimes pops up here where it, you're not going to have a dedicated Delirium deck, but sometimes you'll just have like an Exorable Blob or just like one random Delirium card or, you know, like an Obsessive Skinner or something. And then you just have like a Terrarian and you have a Grapple and you just kind of naturally kind of hit Delirium. It. Yeah, you're not like working in that direction, but hey, yeah. mice. Um, now, what about the composition of these decks? Like, if somebody wants to go home and let's say they have not yet drafted the blue green uh, emerge deck yet, what should they be looking at? Like, how many emerge creatures? That kind of stuff. Three to five emerge creatures is about good. I've never actually got to a point where I'm like cutting emerge cards, but once I have like four or five, I'm just not going to take them very often. Yeah. Uh, four or more kind of like sacrificial fodder type cards. Primal Druid is the only one that I'm really hesitant about including without yeah, Emerge. It's very mediocre. Because I'm just going to play my Enlightened Maniacs and Cultists and, and Drunau Corpse Trawlers. These are all just fine cards. So mm-hmm. you like four more of those. And then, uh, you know, five or so other creatures. So you, you Which, want, by the way, you can also throw under the bus. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So you want a total of like, you know, 13 to 16 creatures. And sometimes you even have more than that if they're good ones. You do need some random creatures, though. Even if they're not, they're, yeah, like you said, literally the sacrifice ones. Mm-hmm. You can't just have a hand of, like, two merge creatures and, 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 and a five drop and four lands. Like, that's just not good. Right. So uh, you want some interaction. I mean, you're playing blue-green, which is not known for its heavy interaction, but cards like Prey Prawn, Drag Under, Spontaneous Mutation, just, like, sometimes your opponent plays a flyer and you just need a way to deal with it or a utility creature. Uh, a couple other, like, you know, smoothing or fixing spells like Turian or Grapple or Vessel that just kind of make the deck flow. Uh, importantly, zero pump spells. Part of what you're doing by playing three fours and five fives and all these giant creatures on turn four is that you just don't need pump spells. Like, yeah. Aim High is just not a card I want in my blue green No, decks. you also just ran out of room pretty quickly because you do need each of these things to make the deck work. And by the way, Clear Shot does not count as a pump spell. You may no, run that, it. Is, that, is a, that is an interaction <laughs> you, spell. That you is may a run it. <laughs> Yeah, so anyway, uh, th- that that's for the, the blue-green emerge deck. And I got to say, I, I think this deck is incredibly powerful and incredibly fun. I, I'm i savoring it. Oh, yeah. Oh, I, one, I still get foul emissaries like on the wheel. and coming Yeah, late. one of the reasons that I think that, the, that we're both so high on the deck right now is... The we're the people, only ones the that know about it. people drafting online are just <laughs> not priority. Like, you're getting grapples with three cards left. You're, you're you know, you're wheeling Enlightened Maniacs, so... If these things change, if the getting the pieces is harder, the deck does get worse. Right now, I end up in this deck so often because it's just like, hey, look, I you know seventh pick primal druid and eighth pick you know it of the horde swarm. All right, I, I guess I'm just going to draft this deck again. Exactly. So primal druid also, by the way, does let you splash pretty easily. This is a format that lends itself to splashing. Yeah, it's got the, the splashing's weird, right? You've got because like when I first saw it, I didn't think you could because there wasn't like a land, you know. Right. And I thought, well, no, there's no evolving like, wilds. Yeah, no evolving wilds, but like terrarian definitely helps yeah. get the job done, and it's easy to pick up and at low impact on your deck. And then, like you said, the the primal druid can do it too. And, and the games just go longer, and you can afford to have. An off-color card in your hand a little bit. So yeah, I think Scour the Laboratory is probably my best color fixing. <laughs> yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's the blue, the blue cultivate. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's move on to the the other deck now. 
we're not trying to say that there's only two decks that you can draft in the format, but these are the two that we've had the most fun and I've had definitely the most success with as well, which is blue, red, spells. So this is a really synergistic deck, right? This is one of those decks that uh, really needs the right pieces of the puzzle, but when you put them together, it really rewards you. Um, you know, you get a lot of crossover, right? You get this spells matter type thing, and then you can even uh, put some sub themes in, which we'll talk about in a minute. So let's talk about the payoff cards, right? So these are the cards uh, that, that say, all right, you've, you've got 10 or 11 instants or sorceries in your deck. Why? Like, w- what are we getting for it? And we're talking about cards like the one that we open in our pack, Thermo Alchemist. That card could just pile on a ton of damage. An uncommon Weaver of Lightning is nuts. That card's insane. Uh, it combos with any number of removal spells, uh, burn spells and such to just mow down your opponent's creatures. And randomly is a 1-4 reach, which just blocks everything really well, which, uh, you know, it doesn't seem like Weaver... It feels like they push Weaver of Lightning a bit, right? It's just like, why does it have reach? Have you ever cast Savage Alliance with a Weaver yes, of Lightning in play? Yes, oh, yeah. we have, my friend. <laughs> it is disgusting. Um, Ingenious Scob. Look, we liked it in the Emerge deck where it's like medium, like it's just a solid 3-drop. Here it's very good. Like it's often a 3-4 that you can pump up, you know, to 4-5 or even 6 damage. Um, so that's really good. One of the payoff cards is Mercurial Geist. That's the two blue, red. It's a 1 3 flyer and it's got kind of super prowess. It gets plus 3 plus 0 when you cast an instant sorcery. That's the kind of card that you don't want to think of it as like a 1 3 flyer that's occasionally a 4 power flyer. It's actually like 7 power for two turns in a row and then your opponent's dead a lot more often. Um, they have to respect it. It can steal games from them pretty easily too. Oh yeah, when my opponent plays one of these and I can't kill it, I'm like, well, I guess I'm dead. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is one of the cards I do that, think that makes too. me want to play Uncaged Fury. You just yeah, you can just sixteen your opponent out of nowhere. It's really e- it's trivially easy. Yeah, yeah. Um, Shreds of Sanity is a card I've actually played with, which is one I did not like at all in the set review. I just thought, what is going on here? It's too no, much. It, it is good in red blue specifically. Yeah. Yeah, but it actually is good in red blue. Um, I don't. I think you can still get away with taking it late. Like, yeah, it's a card. So this is the it. tuna red. Uh, you get back an instant and a sorcery and then discard a and card. And discard a card, yeah, and it's a sorcery itself. It's If you have a good mix of instants and sorcery, especially if you throw in like a madness card or two, then, did. Then, then this card is very good. And not many people at the table are going to want it, so no. you don't have to third pick. It's an uncommon, right? Yeah. So you just don't see that many of them anyway. Uh, one of the ones that jumped out for me, and uh, sample size small, so I'm really curious to hear your your take on this one. But Curious Homunculus, that, that's the one in a blue homunculus, and you can tap it for a, a mana that can cast instants or sorceries. And if at the beginning of your upkeep, if you've got three instants and or sorceries in your graveyard, you transform it into Voracious Reader, your, <laughs> your yeah. favorite. And that's a 3-4 with prowess that makes all your instants and sorceries cost one less to cast. And the thing that surprised me about it is that I was running as many cantrips, you know, I was running take inventory. Like, I just had right. two of them, but I'm just like, sure, like, it's four damage cantrip or whatever. And uh, I was able to get this thing transformed way quicker than I thought. Like, you know, turn four, boom, Voracious Reader. And Voracious Reader's strong. Like, that card for two mana is 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 unfair for sure. Yeah, and it also combines, again, with the self-mill theme. Where, where if you yeah, cast a, totally. a Lab Brood or, or what have you. Yeah. I, I, don't, I still don't take this card high, though. Like, do you... No, Do I think it's a, a I think it's a solid mid pick. Okay. I, I, if you if it's pack two and you know you're red blue, this is a premium card. Okay, like you can actually take it third and be happy. Yeah, I was really happy with how it performed, and I took it really late. Like yeah. I did not prioritize. Well, the, it's it, again one of the advantages of being in this deck is that you'll get curious among those seventh pick. Nobody wants no, it. The blue green deck just shouldn't be taking it. No, of course not. I, I had a funny situation come up by the way where I had this in play on my upkeep. It triggered. Mm-hmm. I tapped it for a colorless, then it flipped, and then I cast an expensive spell <laughs> oh, really? because like I got the double or... bonus. Yeah. Oh, I, that's crazy. <laughs> that's pretty sweet. It, when it, it, it's still tapped when it transforms, right? It, it was still tapped, so I couldn't attack that turn, but I, I essentially got two mana out of it because yeah. I got the mana and then it flipped and made my spell cheaper. It was <laughs> actually Scour really Laboratory, which is what oh, I was guessing. No, I fully approved. And then, uh, so yeah, the next segment actually is the self mill. So this is this enables spontaneous mutation, which while not an instant or sorcery, still triggers your prowess creatures and is exactly what this deck wants. When you have seven cards in your graveyard routinely, this is just one mana yeah, kill a creature. It is. Uh, Grizzled Angler. Especially when you're trying to set up, you know, this Thermo Alchemist plan and stuff right. where it's like you're not actually engaging them in right. combat. When you, when you make their 4-4 four, four into a 0-4 essentially, then it doesn't matter. You, they have yeah. nothing they can block anyway. Yeah. Uh, so you have like Grizzled Angler, Laboratory Brute, and then Curious Homunculus. Uh, take Inventory gets a little better here, though. 
Honestly, I'm not really into taking that many. Yeah, I, I, you know, I've been playing it. Like, the, the thing is... A two-mana draw card spell sometimes just triggers all your stuff and it's right. fine. Right, and, and like, it, it, it sets up your stupid homunculus and all yeah. this stuff, and it's like, fine, you know? And I've had three of them, and yeah. then, then I'm, you know, quite happy to run it. Um, there's also an emerge sub-theme that you can work into this, too. It... It's not so much sub theme as just taking advantage of good emerge cards, right? Um, you know, you can play your wretched griffs and your draniard behemoths, but the vexing scuttler it really shines here. You're getting yeah. back premium spells, and and li- like in the emerge deck, it's just not a cost to play an exultant cultist or an enlightened no. maniac. You just put those cards in your deck. Uh, one one mondo combo I like is malevolent whispers plus emerge. You take their creature <laughs> and then you sack it to your emerge oh, creature. Oh no, it's so brutal. Actually, I, I had someone. <laughs> Take my creature, hit me, hit me for five, and I'm like, all right, well, that was bad, but whatever. They hit me from like, you know, 16 to 11, who cares? Then they're, they're like, vexing scuttler, sack your creature, get back the multiple source, go. And I'm just like, oh, no, this isn't good. And then the next <laughs> turn, they took another creature, then sacked it to a wretched griff, and I was just like, oh, <laughs> come on. That's great. It's the new red black sacrifice deck. It, it really is. And, and see, this isn't like, oh, this is a deck you should draft, more like, if you've got three emerge guys, Malevolent Whisper is a real card. Yeah, this is an, a, this is an interaction you should take note of rather yeah. than that you should draft. Um, the spells. I'm going to go through a few of these. Um, you know, you want the premium spells. A lot of them are obvious. Incendiary Flow is fantastic. Galvana Bombardment. I really love Drag Under. I take it pretty highly. I think it's great in this deck. Spreading Flames. I will play one of. I usually don't want the second one, um, but the first one is good enough. It's... It, I mean, the card's insane if you cast it, right? Yeah. Like it's six mana or six damage anywhere you want. Um, I'll usually play one unsubstantiate, though. I, I do consider that a little more borderline. Like I'd trade it for a, uh, for a drag under every time if I could. Um, but still, you know, I, I do find that it, it does hold its own just enough as long as you're willing to be patient with it. Savage Alliance is fantastic. I mean, Savage this is, is one of the best uncommons. It's, it's the period. best red uncommon. It's definitely the best red uncommon. But I mean, I, it's up there, dude. Like, I think Clear Shot's probably better, but, like, <laughs> this card's nuts. Like, I love... Th- like, this thing just takes care of, of, of so much business. And, you know, you mentioned it with uh, Weaver of Lightning's insane. You know, a card that's gone down for me a lot is Alchemist Greeting. This is a four and a red. Deal four, Madness one and a red, yeah, Sorcery. Yeah, if I can't Madness it, I'm really unhappy well, with this Well, it's just a card. Reduced Ashes if you can't Madness it. It's just it's not... A it's a worse just, Reduced yeah, Ashes. it's not a premium card. I actually card. like Reduced Ashes now, and I really don't like... Alchemist Greedy in that scenario. If I do have a few Madness outlets, and it's fine. And if I'm like the Dragoons deck, then yeah, whatever. Yeah. Give me those things. Um, take Inventory we talked about already. And then another one um, that it's popped up a, a notch for me is Make Mischief. Um, it's weird. I don't know why I didn't put this together, but I recognized early that there's a lot of one toughness creatures in this format and that uh, cards like Smoldering Werewolf and that kind of thing would be good. Yet somehow, I still kind of thought Make Mischief was a little too clunky. But like, God, if it's killing something and giving you the devil, it's great. It's also uh, filling up your graveyard for some of the stuff we mentioned. So the first Make Mischief usually makes the cut in my deck. And the cool part is you don't have to prioritize picking it either. It's not a fourth pick or whatever. You know, you I, can get it 10. I frequently play exactly one Make yeah. Mischief. Yeah, same thing with me too. Um, when it comes to the composition of the deck, putting this thing together, look, Thermo Alchemist is, is one of the keys to the deck. If you can get a bunch of those, it's very difficult for your opponent to really interact and you can pile on a ton of damage. Weaver of Lightning is the same thing. The truth of it is, if you're prioritizing them, you usually end up with between one and three Alchemists and zero to one Weavers. It's an uncommon and it's only two packs, so you don't see a ton of Weavers, but pick them if they're there. Uh, the more the merrier as well. You want as many as you can get of either. As far as the burn spells and that kind of thing goes, I mean... You obviously want the top tier stuff. That's your that's your premium, your drag unders and the, and the burn spells that I mentioned early. But you can go down the chain pretty far. Like you know, if if it's an internal sorcery that affects the board in any way, you're probably pretty happy to play it. And then you know you're going to pick up your unsubstantiates and your make mischiefs, take inventories later in the pack, and you can kind of fill out the deck with those. Yeah, once you you know once you have two ingenious scobs and a mercurial geist and a couple alchemists, like you're starting to put cards like Bard Hostility into your deck. The, yeah. the one red plus yep. three plus O card, like. You just need to be triggering your cards. Curious Homunculus is just like, well, play play 13 spells and I'll, and I'll be great. Yeah, so. totally. For creatures, this is a tough one to nail down because you'll play, I, I guessed on here, 7 to 14 creatures, which you, is you just a very... rid of numbers. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a very wide range. But I've had a version of this deck that was incredibly spell heavy. Yeah. You know, with the Thermal Alchemist and stuff. But I've also had decks that look pretty much like a normal deck, right? Like a 14, 13 creature deck or whatever. Um, it's just that every other 
uh, spell in the deck were, were instants or sorceries and I had the payoff cards for it. So that, you know, lots of ingenious gobs and stuff like that. So I, I think that this deck has a lot of flexibility on when it can actually be good. I think the best version is probably somewhere around like 10 to 12 creatures. Um, I think it's a little creature-like compared to a normal deck, but like Ingenious Gob is fantastic here to go along with all the other stuff that we talked about there. Basically, the more creatures you have, the more this starts looking like a blue-red tempo deck mm -hmm. where you do play Tattered Hunter and Nibbles of Dusk and just like prowess your opponent out. Totally. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. Whereas tempo like deck. the nut version of the deck has like six creatures that are all just like Geists and Thermal Alchemists <laughs> yeah. and Scobs. You know, you just have like six or seven yeah. and then like 15 spells. Yeah. But that's just not going to happen that often. Yeah. And so you like, you should be aware that if that does happen, yeah, go for it yeah. do it. But your more average version is not going to, not going to look like that. Um, also, like you said, w when it comes to the tempo version, you can play your Tattered Haunters, your Niblis of Dusk, right? And you get to play all the good cards too. Don't forget that, right? Like this is a synergy deck, but since you don't always get to get every single piece you want, cards like Smoldering Werewolf, Geist of the Archives, yeah, get in there. You know, these are just good cards that you can play and uh, just make your deck better. Well, another reason that these decks are so good, like another reason the blue-red deck is so good is, again, you're not paying these huge costs. Like you, you can just put good blue and red cards in your mm -hmm. deck, and you're gonna your deck's gonna work out pretty well. Yeah. Like you, you are not playing, yeah, you know, you're not playing uh, spells that have like little to no text. You, you're playing spells that actually do something. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. Uh, I had the last version of blue red that I drafted. I passed three thermo alchemists for like incendiary flows and stuff right. like that, and none of them came back. And, you know, you think, well, you made the blue-red spells deck, but you forgot the payoff cards. And I'm like, I had Niblis of Dusk, I had Ingenious Scob, I had two Mercurial guys in this deck, and I just didn't need them, the, the Thermochemist. So that, that can absolutely be the case. And then, of course, when you're picking your non-creature spells, prioritize instants and sorceries as often as possible. They should make up the bulk of the deck, so you're going to have anywhere from, you know, 9 to 13 or whatever of these, depending on how your creature's ended up panning out. Again, I'm perfectly fine by, with playing um, cycling cards that just cycle, take inventory, sure, whatever. Um, this is, of course, why I love Drag Under so much because it cycles and also affects the board at the same time. Filling up your graveyard, triggering all your stuff and keeping your opponent at bay because oftentimes you just need to buy yourself some time. It also goes well in both versions of the deck that we're describing. The tempo version is great. It's also good in the in the you know Thermo Alchemist version as well. Basically, the only spell that I put in my deck that's not an instant or sorcery is spontaneous mutation. Which yeah, so I, I think I would I'm happy to play like two of those. Right. Okay. Um. You you mentioned about combat tricks, and then uh, you know when it when it comes to the shadows over Innistrad cards, I mean it hasn't changed a whole lot, right? This is one of those themes that carried over. So the the cards you thought were good for this deck and shadows, yeah, they're still pretty much good. Um. One more deck that we should touch on before we sign off. This one uh, is more one that like. I don't have it quite on the same tier, but I think it's really good, and I think it's worth talking about. It's Red Green Werewolves here, so let's talk about that one. Yeah, this is, this is I think, a less good deck than Blue Red or Blue Green because it's not doing anything particularly broken. But I wanted to mention it because Red Green, I did not like much in Shadows. I thought, I thought that the, the Werewolves didn't particularly synergize all that well together, and you weren't really getting anything out of it by, by putting a bunch of Werewolves in your deck. Once you add Eldritch Moon, you actually have something here, and what that is is... You have a deck with a lot of normal cards, normal limited deck, but a lot of your werewolves just have this activated ability of paying a bunch of mana to just turn into a giant monster. Yeah, to take over the game in the late part. And that yeah. just gives your deck a lot of uh, good consistency and staying power. You get to play 18 land, you get to play just like a good base of creatures, and then also just have your late game all taken care of. Like you get to play cards that are effective on turn 2 and effective on turn 10, and that kind of flexibility is really, really important. There's some nice cards in here too, right? We talked about um, all the Transform Werewolves. I love all of them. Basically. Uh, with with Olvenwald Captive yeah. being kind of my little buddy. But like even like Brazen Wolves, right? It was a card that we gave a high grade in the review and it's performed. Like that card hits hard. Oh, yeah. I think based on where I see the werewolves being taken right now, However good most people think the werewolves are, they're, they are better than that. They are they are like, criminally underrated across the board. Vildren Pack Outcast, the the, the four the five four mana. trample. Yeah. You can pay a red to give it pulse on minus one, then you just flip it into just a five seven <laughs> monster. <laughs> it has like the biggest fireball ever attached. Yeah, yeah. I mean, 
how is that a common? That yeah. just, that's just an absurd card. And, and I think people look at it and they think like, oh, it's just like a got stuff arsonist, you know, from, from Shadows. And it's like, no, arsonists are just like a mediocre playable. This is just an actively good card. Yes. They're not equivalent. They're and, not equivalent. And, and, and I see, mentioned the captive. Seventh, yeah. Yeah, the captive is like this great card in the oh, early captive game. Is, is the best green common. It is. I think it's better than Prey Upon. I do too. And I was saying this uh, last week at the GP. I was, I was on air saying yeah. that I thought it was better and I got a little flack for it. And I'm just like, I feel confident. Like, I think no, it's better. No, I think you nailed it. And I think it's just just better, yeah. And then the cool part is, is that you know, for people that are maybe a little newer to limited, like this is a much more like close to the vest limited deck, right? Oh, like, this certainly. Isn't crazy. You are not doing anything particularly fancy. You, no. What you're doing is drafting a curve of creatures with some <laughs> combat tricks, some removal spells. It just so happens that your two drop doubles as a seven drop, and yeah. that's just insane. Like and that's just great. Two mana one two that taps for a green is is a card I've played happily in many formats. Yep. Add a seven mana activated ability that just turns it into into a, a monster that taps for two mana. It's like, wait, this is great. Yeah, it's just fantastic. Like, so yeah, the the key commons are really not again different than what you'd expect. It's galvanic bombardment, prey upon, brazen wolves, the pack outcast, ubel old captive, and then you know if you want an alchemist greeting, that's just kind of medium here. But but uh, the good red and green commons are are good here. That does make this a fairly level one deck, but uh, it's still it's still not. You know, it, it's not doing anything too flashy, but it's, it's just a good deck. Yeah. And it's it's one it's one I don't mind ending up in. You know, when you look at a color combination like white green or white black, I just don't love ending up there. I'd rather not. Whereas red green, I think is perfectly fine. Beef. It's what's for dinner. I mean, this just puts out a bunch of huge creatures. What, what's not to love about that? Yeah, and you get to play eighteen lands and still have you know good things to do with your lands late game, which means you don't get mana screwed as often, but you also really don't get flooded as often. Yeah. All right, so that's the last of those. Um, how do you feel going in? You know, you did a lot of testing on your own. You did a ton of testing with the team. We've been talking a bunch. Where, where are you at on the format? You feel confident? Uh, yeah, it's just like two things. One, I feel confident that we've done a good job preparing. I, I think that after seeing everything I've drafted, other people have drafted, what's been going on, I feel like we have a good handle on the format. And that's always nice, right? I mean, it's just like that's the whole goal of testing is to try to kind of understand what, what's happening and I think that I think that we've done a good job of that. The second and most exciting is is, is I love doing all this stuff. Like the, the yeah. stuff that's going on in this format. This is this is the kind of magic I like to play. <laughs> no, you're just in heaven, man. And, and, you know, like we, you know when we did a show for Origins, right? Magic Origins. It's like, look, Topin Free Blade. You know, it's a, it's a two mana two two. You, you got to take it because there are two drops really important. And sure, I had fun playing Origins, but look, I didn't go home and do fifty more Origins drafts. I just didn't. And it's just ABC Magic, which nothing wrong with that. But when when I draft and, and I'm like, well, you have to combine this card and then th- this eight drop to make this five four that you can play on turn four, and it's just like, yeah, I'm into all that. Like, yeah. this is a splash format. Like, you get splash third color. Or like, you've got a lot of complicated, fancy things going on. Which I'm not saying every set should be that way because that you know that that wouldn't serve everyone's needs. But yeah, you know, this it, one's it, serving it, your yeah, needs. <laughs> the, 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 this is this is this is the kind of magic I like to play. Yeah, and I, I feel similarly. Uh, I've been drafting this format on my own as much as possible. I was lucky into that pre pre release, so I got my hands on the cards early, and I've kind of you know ridden the wave all the way through. And I feel very prepared, you know, to be in the booth and to talk about this format. Um, I also love drafting it. And I love that feeling because I don't love every format. I like most formats because it's still magic and drafting's awesome. But like this one, it might be a special one. This might be an all timer. So I'm really looking forward to it. Luis, good luck at the PT. We we all hope you crush it. Well, by the time most people are hearing this, then that that's kind of already resolved itself, one way or the other. Well, then good job. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> we did it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, that will do it for uh, this episode of the show. I want to remind you. The Limited Resources is brought to you by ChannelFireball.com. Please do check them out. You know, they, they are a big part of what make Limited Resources possible, and uh, we'd love it if you would visit their website to show them some support. You can find everything you need magic-related. You can find you, even Limited Resources gear. You can find Limited Resources t-shirts, uh, deck boxes, and sleeves. They were instrumental in helping make that happen as well, and it's, it's a really cool, cool thing over there, uh, as well as the free content. I mentioned that before, but, you know, you can go figure out how to play whatever the new decks are from the uh, from the PT if you're into playing standard. And of course, uh, you know, if you need more booster packs, trade in your rares. We know what happens. You draft, you win the draft, you got a pile of rares sitting around that you're never going to use. Put them in a package, send them into CFB. They're going to give you 30% bonus on trade-ins and you can get more booster packs to do more drafts with. It's a circle of life and it's a beautiful thing. Please do 
check them out. If you want to find us on social media, I'm Marshall underscore LR and Luis is LSV. You can find everything related to the podcast at lrcast.com. It just, the front page has links to all of our stuff. Luis's stream, my stream, the, uh, the Facebook page, the YouTube channel. You can subscribe to that to get all the, the sweet new stuff on there. You know, the depth check videos are there, um, and all that kind of stuff. <sighs> That's going to do it. Thanks so much for hanging out. We'll see you next week. I'm Neil Rigby, and my bad beat story comes from... <laughs> I'm the big rig, and my bad beat story comes from the recent pre-release. I was playing the pre-release in our local store, and there was a bunch of new players there. And in round two, I play against this lovely lady, and we chat and have a load of fun. And then in round four, I play against her friend. And I win game one, and I'm about to win game two. And from nowhere, she just goes, oh, I think you should concede. So I go, okay then. So I pick all my cards up. And she's like, what are you doing? I'm like, well, you asked me to concede, so I'll concede. And we'll play game three. So we start playing game three. And what I'd forgotten was I'd started the round ten minutes after everybody else because I'd been playing against Rich on stream. So we get to the end of time gets called on the round. And I'm like, so I'm, I'm on track for winning the tournament. And I'm like, blind. time gets called on the round. And my friend comes up, he's like, oh, can you actually deal enough damage to win and I'm like well I'm attacking for exactly lethal if she doesn't block and I'm thinking like oh she'll not block because obviously I conceded game two and that will be fine so I attack with everything and like go attack and she's like oh block 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 guess it's a draw then and then I don't win the tournament and I'm like oh, oh right then <laughs>